Ephesians chapter 5. Uh, I know I've kind of carried this on for a while, but I'm getting to the best part of it uh, on this thing of biblical music. And um, <clears throat> I mentioned this morning about music a little bit and how God dealt with me. And some of you may not know that story, but uh, when I, uh, when the pastor that was here resigned, um, it left me in charge and I just wasn't sure if I wanted to take the church or not, but, uh, I told him, let's go on like on a six month trial basis. And so we did and God kind of settled some things out and settled some things with me and for me and for the church. And, uh, so now I'm the pastor of this church and, um, the, I can see all the churches start to change. And it was about that time, maybe a little bit before, that Rick Warren had come out with Purpose Driven Life and then later Purpose Driven Church. And, but I had started looking into the, the plan that Rick Warren had established. There was a man out of Chicago named Bill Hybels. He had done similar things. Uh, they were they were rebranding the church. They were calling it seeker friendly, which basically is a way we're not going to offend anybody. Don't worry about us. We won't hurt you. And um, literally, what Rick, Rick Warren did was uh, go up and down the, the streets of um, Orange County, California. Some of the wealthiest neighborhoods in the country are there, and um, talk to all these heathen California people about what it would take to get them into a church. And they all put out their list of demands. Uh, don't preach at us. Don't tell us how we're doing is wrong. Uh, you need to change the music. You get some good music in there. And, uh, and get rid of the pews. Put in chairs. Um, quit wearing a suit and tie. And all this stuff. And so he does that. And he has this success. And he's got campuses all over Orange County now. And then he's expanding out, and I had just heard of him. And so um, I had, there was a man going to this church that I had gone to high school with. And, um, what is this? Okay. Anyway, um, I uh, was, had a friend of mine here, and he played in a Christian rock band. And um, I'd never heard it, never heard the group play or anything like that. But I, the idea popped into my head about having him bring his band here, set it up on the stage and have a youth night. And he would play for that, for that group. And I can tell you that week was a hard week. The week leading up to that youth thing. Because I was getting calls from pastors all over the state asking me what in the world am I doing and uh, I didn't I didn't really like the fact that they stuck their nose in my business but God had a reason for everything and um, there was one pastor and I'm not gonna say who it was that called me and he had a just a different just a, just a different way of bringing it up. And he said, Mike, believe me, he said, I, I understand what you're doing. And he said, you know, I, I'm, not, I'm not criticizing you for trying, you know, to do what it is you're doing. He said, I understand where you're coming from on it. He said, all I'm going to ask you to do is pray about it. And you know what? He left it at that. And I went, thank you for that. And I did. I, I right then I prayed about it and God smote my heart and said, don't you dare. And this was like two days before the event. And I had to call uh, this friend of mine and tell him that I had to cancel. And I said, it wasn't it wasn't what anybody in the church said. It was actually what I feel God told me. And um, so anyway, needless to say, he rebooked that night. Uh, to a different place. Lisa and I went out to hear him 
And as they started playing, I went, okay, I know what you were doing, God. Because it was rough. I mean, it was, it was hardcore metal rock. Um, it did not have any place in the house of God. And, um, you know, I, I say I was doing it for the church or for the youth. No, I was doing it for me. I wanted, I wanted this guy to think of me as somebody that's progressive and going to move forward with things. And I wanted these things to work that I was doing. So the guys in the denomination would say, boy, Hoggard's really doing a good job. And um, now here's what's funny. Some of the same people that have criticized me about that concert uh, have stood against me over the years on the Bible issue. So I didn't, I didn't gain anything uh, from them. I didn't lose anything from them uh, except for their fellowship. And if that's going to be the subject you're going to split on, so well. So anyway, um, it's, you know, that idea of music, it's hard to, dis to sit and define what parameters in music would be Christ-like, what would not be um, you know, the, is it the tempo? Is it the, the fact we're, that we're using rhythm? Uh, is it the, the lyrics? Uh, is it the absence of lyrics? Uh, is, the, is the sound too high? Well, the Bible says play skillfully with a loud noise. And so if you're going to use trumpets, you're going to play them loud. If you're going to use, you know, a tuba, play it loud. And amen, Matthew? Play them tubas loud, buddy. And so anyway, um, I, I may not be able to define it, but it's like uh, immorality. I recognize it when I see it. Okay? Uh, things that are wrong, I can recognize the music that's wrong. I can recognize it when I hear it. And, um, you know, what, what do, are the lyrics saying? What are they doing? What, what does the, how is the music carrying those lyrics and so on? And um, so let's get into where we, where we were a couple of Sunday nights. I appreciate y'all letting me have this last Sunday off. <laughs> yeah. Man, I was sick. Um, anyway, uh, Ephesians chapter 5. Oh, let's see, where were we here? Uh, verse 18 goes, well, verse 17 goes into this. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And that's something that also that God was doing along with that concert. He was getting me to contact him about what he wanted. And... Um, there was a lot, I can say that there was a lot of personal growth in me during those early years here. Uh, and there had to be because I was not ready for what I had. And um, so God just was very patient and good to me. And I didn't deserve it, but that's what he was. And so God was trying to teach me how to call upon him and ask his opinion for things instead of asking everybody else's opinion or going on my own you know, the, the Bible talks about every man did that which was right in his own eyes. And if we're not careful, we'll justify everything we do. And my justification was, man, I want, I want our church to grow. Yeah, okay, that's a good thing. But there's ways to do it, ways not to do it. Okay, and if you, uh, I heard an old preacher say, what you save them with, you save them to. And what he mean by that is if you use unbiblical methods in trying to reach people for the Lord... Once you get them in church, you're going to have to continue with unbiblical methods in order to keep them. And at best, just give them the word of God. And if they can't handle that, pray for them. Maybe God will soften them up some more. But, uh, but anyway, that's how you do it. Verse 16, redeeming the time because the days are evil. That was also in my mind as well. And I knew that we were living in some pretty bad times. But I tell you what, I'd, I'd give the first million of my billion to go back to the 90s. Back before everybody came out. You remember, okay? Remember those days? Yeah, okay. Uh, where, wherefore ye be ye not unwise, uh, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. There's a good one there. In verse um, 18, be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. They are opposite to one another, not collected together. You do not drink wine and then be filled with the Holy Spirit. 
the, the uh, name it, claim it, charismatic crowd has absconded that verse and said, be not drunk, drunk with wine, we're in his excess, but be filled and then be drunk with the spirit. They see them as the same thing. Getting drunk in the spirit it means you're filled with the spirit, but it's not true. Um, the Bible tells us over and over and over, be sober, be sober, be sober. Uh, the elder ladies like Sister Waymire and Sister Bernice Whitehead that used to come here. Uh, they were our two, uh, I call them our 90s ladies because they lived into their 90s. And um, I can remember them bringing up the subject of that concert to me, but they did it in a very respectful manner. And that meant a lot to me. It really, it really smote my heart. And um, I told Brother um, Willard Waymire, James Willard Waymire, their son, Sister Waymire's son, at her funeral. He said, Mike, he said, I want to tell you, he said, I really have a lot of respect for you and, and the way you've let God deal with you. And I knew what he's talking about. And I said, Brother, I said, I decided that it would be better for me to... Um, to have our church be proud of your mom and sister Bernice and not, um, oh, how did I put it? Um, I, I wanted your mom uh, to be proud of her church, not embarrassed by it, is what I said. And he, that meant the world to him. And uh, so I still remember that. But that reason why I bring that up is it's the elder ladies of the church who are to teach the younger ones to be sober. And I think it means be sober. And teach them how to dress and teach them this and that and the other. And so ladies, you know, it's on. Okay? Fill your part, fill your role. You've got young girls looking at you. You've got young boys looking at you. And they're watching your life. And they'll either, they'll either love what you show them and what you present to them. Or they'll despise it. And uh, some are going to despise it anyway. You can't help that. But don't feed it. Amen. Now and then it says verse 19. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. That is all one sentence. Starting in verse 18. Okay. Callie, go ahead and, and uh, show me you can uh, diagram that, that passage for me. Okay, start in verse 18 down to verse 21. Go. All right, let's, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we ask you to bless us tonight. Thank you, Lord, for gathering us here. And Lord, teach us your ways. Teach us to know your will. Father, in this world, with a lot of people, there's just so many questions. And, and Father, here we come along. We're trying to get people to see the old way. Seek out the old paths and so on. And I pray, dear God, that you would help us and bless us. And Father, those that are still seeking righteousness, those that are still seeking truth. I pray, dear God, that number one, we would, we would have it. Or at least as much of it as we can have. And, and that, Father, we can then share it with others. And they, would they would then know what the truth is and that truth would make them free. Father, that's what I care about. I want people to be free when I go to Kenya. Lord, you know my heart. I see people that are used and abused by an evil system out there. And I pray, dear God, Lord, that you would make people free. Make all the pastors free. Free from uh, thinking that they had to go along with all the other pastors. But, Lord, you called them separately. And I pray, dear God, Lord, that you just feed them and fill them with your goodness from your word. And they could stand on their own two feet. And, Lord, you'll bless them for that. And I pray, dear God, that you'd bless us tonight as we open your word. Teach us some good things to know in Jesus' name. And all of God's people say, Amen. Now, uh, Psalms, we covered that. It is a, a sacred poem or, or sacred poem or song, especially one expressing praise and thanksgiving. And that, that goes along with verse 19 and verse 20, giving thanks always for all things unto God. I think of the number of songs that we sing that are thanksgiving type songs, where we're actually, pray anytime you praise God, you're telling him thank you. Anytime you truly worship God, you're thanking Him. Uh, and you're not trying to draw. This is, to me, and there's nothing wrong with congregational singing, nothing wrong with 
uh, me wanting to sing a song every now and then by myself or whoever. Um, but the bottom line is, this is for you to do yourself, you between you and God. That way you're not performing. Okay, I don't think I'm performing when I'm up there. I'm doing what God has given me the, the blessing to do. So, um, you know, this is written on a personal level for us to do. So psalms and then hymns uh, and, and spiritual songs. We talked about hymn to, to sing and praise or adoration uh, to the Lord. Used in the Septuagint to translate several Hebrew words meaning a song praising God. And uh, that is Webster's definition of as well, is to praise in adoration. So uh, the song, God of our fathers, whose almighty hand is, is a hymn. Uh, Eternal father, strong to save is a hymn. In fact, that's the Navy hymn. Um, let's see here. Um, you need something else. Praise him, praise him, Jesus our blessed redeemer. That's a hymn. So anything that sings in praise or adoration to God or one of his attributes is, is categorized as a hymn. And then Hebrews 2.11. I keep going back to this. I love this. I don't know if I shared this with you a couple, week, couple Sunday nights ago. Yeah, I did. But this, this verse, verse 12 of Hebrews 2, jumped out on me one time, hit me across the face, made me cry six ways from Sunday because I got it. This is Jesus talking. And Jesus says, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. And I just lost it. Reading that and thinking, I never thought about Jesus the singer. But I bet he sings a lot better than all of us. Amen. I bet he does. And I'm like, I can't, it would be awesome to hear a singer that number one could sing in any range. He could sing all four parts if he wanted to. In fact, in, in uh, Ezekiel one, uh, God's voice sounded like uh, many waters. Okay. Not just a faucet, but many waters. Okay. So God can replicate his voice thousands of times over. He could sound like a whole choir if he wanted to. And then to hear to him never make a mistake, never forget the words because he wrote them and just on and on and on. But I never thought of Jesus, this, the singer. And I and I keep trying to hear it, what it would sound like in my mind. And it sounds too much like me. So I know that can't be. And uh, but I, I one of these days, I just when I get to heaven, I just want to sit and listen to Jesus sing his songs. Amen. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I am the children which God hath given me. And the whole point of this is, is that Jesus is not ashamed to come in this church. That's, that's, that's what I think I told uh, Brother Waymire. That her mom should be proud of her church and honored by her church and not ashamed of it. And, uh, but Jesus is not ashamed to call us his brethren. Okay. And we're not the, like I mentioned, my uncle Sonny this morning. We're not the uncle Sonny's of God's kingdom. We're not the brother that nobody talks about because he does bad things. We're not that person. We are the people that, and there's lots of others. It's a big family. Amen. Uh, and revelation chapter seven says this without number, uh, close as I can remember it. So anyway, that's what it, that's what a hymn represents. Now spiritual songs. Uh, you can turn to First Kings four. This is a testimony of of uh, Solomon, um, and the wisdom that God gave to Solomon. Um, apparently, was more than just spoken wisdom and sitting on a a judge's seat, judging and discerning things like the the two women that had newborn babes. And one of the women rolled over and in the night and with her baby lying next to her and crushed it and killed it. So she, while the other woman was asleep, she took her baby and began to feed her baby. Well, her baby doesn't know the difference. They were newborn. And so the next day they come to Solomon. Solomon, uh, you need to help us here. Uh, this woman 
has taken my baby. She rolled over and crushed her baby. Well, she gave me the crushed baby. She took my baby. And then the other woman is saying, no, no, this is my baby. You're the one that did that. And Solomon said, bring me a sword. What are you going to do? I'm going to split it in half so you both have a half. And the mother who really was that mother said, no, let her take it. And Solomon said, now I got you. Now I know who you are. You're the real mother. Because the fake mother said, here, cut it in half. Okay. And that's just the, salt, the wisdom that he had. But notice this. And God gave Solomon wisdom and understanding exceeding much. Uh, and largeness of heart, even as the sand that is on the seashore. Think about that. Think what, what his IQ must have been. There was a phrase I was searching for this morning during Sunday school that I had just learned over the weekend. And, and it's, um, it, what, it relates to how things work in the natural world as far as, you know, vegetation and human life. And it goes to show you that we are not, we did not evolve accidentally. And the phrase is called irreducible, um, oh, come on, irreducible complexity, okay? Now, have you ever seen those little, those little one-celled creatures like in a microscope and they have a little tail that makes them move around? Has anybody ever, anybody ever seen those? You've never seen it with your eye, but you've seen probably pictures of them and that little tail Actually, at the end, it spins around. And one scientist got to looking at that, and he's going, that's an outboard motor and a propeller. It's spinning around, and, it's, and that's what makes that cell move around. It's called a flagellum. And he started doing, he started looking closer at what mechanism made this thing to spin around off of a tail and move it around. And he discovered that not only could this thing change uh, direction, if it wanted to go in a different direction, it could move the tail any way it wanted to, to steer itself. Now, the thing has no eyes, but it steers itself around looking for food and things like that. And, and it's also, um, it also gauges sort of like the, the water pressure or the pressure of the medium that it sits in. Um, if it needs to move it harder, it can to get out of a certain area. If it needs to move it less, it's got gears. And it has a universal joint. This scientist, is, I'm not kidding you, he, he did the engineering of it. He had an engineer help him out. And you look this up, irreducible complexity, and you're going to find this picture. A guy did a diagram of it, and he showed that here's the propeller. Here is uh, the bushings that go around, you know, for the ball bearings. And he said, there is a, um, there's a U-joint in there. And he said, a, a, a thing to drive the motor that runs down in there and spins the, spins the propeller. And he said, there, when you get down to it, there's five components to this thing moving, being able to move around and search for food. And the idea is, if you take one of those components out, none of them work. So, Chris, let's say you had an old Dodge. Okay, I don't know how they operate now. I don't know much about motors anyway. But you take it in to the service place because the distributor cap's messed up. Do they still use distributor caps? Okay. I don't know. But anyway, um, the boss knows how to fix it, but he's got a new guy in. And he tells the new guy, he says, we got to fix that distributor cap. So I need you to bring me uh, the things necessary to fix that distributor cap. So the guy doesn't know anything. He goes out and he gets a hot dog on a bun. And um, he gets... Uh, a light bulb, he gets a horse whip and a marshmallow and a cup of coffee and he sets it on the motor. And the boss looks at it, what are you doing? He said, this is evolution. All I have to do is wait for these parts to fall in place and then there will be a distributor cap. 
Now, that's funny, but that is the exact same thing that you're staring at. When you look at, at those five engineered parts to a one-celled organism and understand that its DNA is complex enough to make sure that the next paramecium or the next cell or whatever it is, the next one has exactly the same thing on it that the father did. And, it, and if it does, if it has one part missing, it won't work. It's like having a car without a distributor cap. Will the thing work? No. You can do without the air conditioner. You can do without the dashboard lights. You can do without power seats. You can do without a radio. There's all kinds of things you can do without in a car, but you cannot have a car without a distributor cap. It will not work. No matter how many other parts you keep putting on there, it won't work. Period. It won't work. And that's called irreducible complexity. And you start looking for that in every creature that exists and you find it and you say, how then did all five of these parts show up on the same exact day so that the next set of paramecium all have that same adjustment to their DNA? How does that happen? There is no answer for it at all. Because they refuse to allow for an engineer or an intelligence of some kind to design that little system on this one-celled creature that to us means nothing. We could go our whole life and not know about them. So that's, what I, that's, that's the kind of wisdom that God gave Solomon. It gave him wisdom in Ecclesiastes 1 to show us the water cycle. How water goes up in the air from the sea. And, this, and the water comes back over top of us, falls down as rain, runs down into the fields, runs through the rivers. Rivers run down into the sea, yet the sea is not full. And it just keeps going like that. Nobody knew that. Nobody knew DNA existed until David wrote about it in Psalm 139, 16. In thy book, all my members were written. And so that's the kind of wisdom that Solomon had. And Solomon's wisdom excelled the wisdom of all the children of the East Country. And all the wisdom, in other words, he was smarter than the, the Chinese, the ancient Chinese. Smarter, wiser than the ancient Japanese. And Confucius is their god of wisdom. They have basically idolized Confucius and his sayings. And that's their, that's their, their biblical, their doctrine anyway. For he was wiser than all men, than Ethan the Ezraite, Heman and Chalcol and Darda, the sons of Mahal. And his fame, of course he was wiser than them. He had named his sons regular things. Yeah. Solomon was, yeah, that's an easy name. And, and it, his fame was in all nations round about. And he spake 3,000 proverbs and his songs were 1,005. He wrote 1,005 songs in his lifetime. Well, I'd love to hear them. Amen? I would love to hear them. Maybe in heaven. God, maybe God preserved them. All right? Now, First Chronicles 25. Here it is. All these were under the hands of their father for song. This is about uh, the temple and temple worship. The hands of their father for song in the house of the Lord. Did they sing songs in the house of the Lord? Yes. Did they use instruments? Yes. Cymbals. Again, percussion instruments. It's a pleasant sound if done right. Psalteries and harps. Psalteries are, are instruments that have strings that are hit with a hammer. Technically, a piano would count under that. It's hit with a hammer. Um, a um, hammer dulcimer is a type of psaltery. You hit it with a hammer. Um, a zither would be more like along the line of a harp. That's what it's called, an auto harp. And harps for the service of the house of God, according to the king's order to Asaph, Jeduthun, and Heman. So the number of them with their brethren that were instructed in the songs, look at this phrase, songs of the Lord. It's got to be God's song. In God's house, got to be God's song. Even all that were cunning was 204 score and eight. Now let me go back to something here. Uh, I had a guy that w lived in Chicago and he was crazy. Because he, he kept getting on to me in an email that I shouldn't preach my words. I should just read Bible verses and let you figure it out. And that when we sing, we, sh we are only limited to sing the songs that are in the Bible and nothing else. Well, I look here at verse 32, 1 Kings 4, 
And I see that Solomon wrote a thousand and five songs and apparently none of them are listed in scripture. But who gave him the songs? Apparently God did. God gave him the wisdom for the songs and the music. Okay. I might be able to come up with music for lyrics that you got, but I am not a lyricist. I can tell you that. So anyway, um, this was in the house of God. Job 35 verse nine. By reason of the multitude of oppressions, they make the oppressed to cry. They cry out by reason of the arm of the mighty, but none saith, where is God my maker who giveth songs in the night? I like that. Usually, Alicia is like me. Usually there's music going on here 24 seven. As long as I'm awake, there's music going on in here. You're going to see me tapping my foot. You might see me making lyrics. Um, but I've got music going on here right now and it just never leaves. And when I lay down in bed at night, uh, sometimes I like to just hear that and it's good. It help. It'll help you sleep. Yeah, you, I have, I've made songs up in my dreams. They're the most beautiful songs in the world. As soon as I wake up, they're gone. Never remember a single one of them. So anyway, that's God's way of saying, Mike, uh, -uh. But none saith, where is God my maker, who giveth songs in the night, who teaches us more than the beasts of the earth. Look at there. And to make us wiser than the fowls of the heaven. And um, I just, you know, I, I love God for giving us the gift of music. Amen. I love music. Uh, it's my, uh, who was it? You asked me w what made me start playing the piano. Uh hearing somebody else play the piano. Um, my mom used to come over here and clean the church. And I'd sit at the piano. I was little. And uh, I would just, she caught me picking out church songs with one hand. And she said, I think I'm going to get him lessons. And so that's how that got started. And I just had an interest in it uh, for most of my life. Uh, but anyway, God teaches us uh, with these songs, by the way, many of these songs are prophetic, and we're going to see that tonight. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusted in him, and I am helped. Therefore, my heart greatly rejoiceth, and with my song will I praise him. How many of you have a song that's your favorite Christian song, and you run to it all the time when something happens or whatever? How many of you got one? Okay, how many of you got an ACDC one that... Uh, listen, music, music, um, some of the songs written about music back in the seventies, um, listen to the music and, uh, there's several others that basically talk about how music draws us in and music puts us in a different mind or puts us in a different mood or whatever. There's all kinds of songs written about that. And, um, we know um, the, this era of rock and roll that we currently live in all went, came down to a man by the name of Robert Johnson. And uh, he, was a, he was a black, uh, black um, musician, kind of, uh, living in, I think it was Miss... What just happened here? That's weird. Uh, living down in Mississippi, and he would show up these honky-tonks and he'd, he'd want to sit in with the group playing on stage. And they didn't like him because he couldn't play. And they, they just run him off all the time. Well, he disappeared. Nobody know what happened to him. What happened to him was on, on a certain road. And this scene that I'm telling you ended up in the movie, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? If you've seen that movie or if you watch that movie, this scene is in that movie. Robert Johnson went to this place in the road. It was a crossroad. And he got right there in the middle there. And he made a compact with the devil. He, he sang a song about it, put it on his first album. But all of a sudden now, four or five months later, he comes back and he's not carrying a six string guitar. He's got a seven string guitar. Or is it five? Five string and then six. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, he added an extra string to it and they're going, what's that for? He didn't say a word and he got up on stage. And man, he took off. And those guys are going, dude, what happened to you? And what he did was he made an agreement with the devil. 
And at the age of 27, he became the first member of the 27 Club. He uh, got into a fight at a honky-tonk over a woman. And this guy shot him or stabbed him or something like that, but killed him. Graveyard dead. And there's a whole list. You look this up on, in the internet somewhere. I think it's on Wikipedia. But there's a whole list of rock singers, people related to the rock and roll business that died at 27 years old. Seems to me very obvious that something is a pattern and something, you know, is th that some of these people really do. And then you have the singers that say that when they get on stage, something takes over them. Um, who is, um, who's the one that has Sasha Fierce as her Beyonce? When she goes out on stage, this, this entity called Sasha Fierce takes her over. She says, she's very bold about it. She says, yeah, I just, become a completely different person. And um, I've heard other rock singers say that, you know, if you, if you come out on stage or you see me on stage, there's something playing. There's something causing me to sing. Some of these ridiculously high notes for men to sing and belt them out. And just the way the gravelly voice singing, the way they sing it uh, just has this evil sound to it. And you just know where it's coming from. And one of these guys who used to sing with the Who, uh, he... He admitted this on uh, recording. He said, if you, would, if you were to come out on stage and try to mess with me on stage, he said, I'd probably come close to killing you. He said, in fact, I think I probably would kill you because something is taking me over and I don't have any control over it whatsoever. And it's just a lot of testimonies like that. Uh, even Katy Perry, whose mom and dad were in the Word Faith movement. They were uh, missionaries. They, had, they were evangelists and they used music and things like that. And she grew up in church singing church songs. And then she admitted, she said, I guess you could say I sold my soul to the devil. Very bold about it. And, uh, of course, she comes out with uh, my boyfriend's an alien, number one. And then I kissed a girl and I liked it. So what was, what, does she have a usefulness in the devil's kingdom? Absolutely. No doubt about it whatsoever. Music that we sing religiously in a religious fashion for a religious setting should be Something that you know God favors. And how do you know that? You get to know God. You get to know His Word. And God will start fixing your music problem. With my song will I praise Him. And there's nothing wrong if you can't write a song and you don't know lyrics and things like that. There's nothing wrong for you to find a song in the hymn book or a sign song that somebody sings that you know is biblically based. You know it's sound. You know, it's, it's got the right message to it and so on. And um, there's nothing wrong with that. Psalm 32, thou art my hiding place. Thou shalt preserve me from trouble. Thou shalt compass me about with, here it is, songs of deliverance. A lot of our songs in our hymn books are songs of deliverance. The spiritual songs are songs, usually songs of deliverance. I once was lost in sin and now I'm lost again. That's the Arminian version of it. But Jesus took me in and did a little light from heaven fill my soul. That's a song of deliverance because you say I used to be lost. Now I'm found. Jesus has saved me. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. Uh, I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way. Look at this. Uh, spread the tidings all around. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. That's what a spiritual song does. It gives, uh, it sings about the deliverance that God has given us. And then um, it is meant to instruct people in the doctrines of Christianity. So this is why we can't have a Catholic hymn book in our church. Because invariably, some of the songs in there are going to speak in favor of the Eucharist, the Mass, the cookie, the wafer, the little piece of the Pillsbury dough thing. Okay? The sun god wafer that they say, this is God right here. This is Christ right here. Eat Christ and you can be saved for as long as the, till the next time you sin. And that's how long it lasts. And they say, now you have God in you. But we can't have that in this church. So we can't sing Ave Maria because it's Hail Mary, full of grace. Pray for us, Mary, now and at the hour of our death. We can't sing that here. And uh, so anyway, there are songs of deliverance. There are songs that are instruction. Instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. And I will guide thee with mine eye. Be ye not as the horse or as the mule, which have no understanding. By the way, do horses and mules have music? 
No. But are there creatures that do? Yeah. Birds. And what are birds characterized in the Bible as? Angels. Okay? And it's something that they have musical instruments built right into them. Cicadas, crickets. I think this year is supposed to be a bad cicada year. Oh, my goodness. I hate that. Uh, but they're, yeah, they're fixing to be everywhere. But anyway, um, you know, animals with music instruments built into them. God did that because he, he shows us angels. I, I thought it was funny that Lucifer has uh, uh, tablets and pipes built into him. And then I thought of birds. I'm going, well, wait a minute. Birds sing. They have us, each one of them has a different song. And that song was given by God. Like crows. Ah! And notice crows are on the unclean list. Or, amen? Stay away from old crow music. Ah! Ah! Yeah. Any, any music that makes you want to go up on stage and bust the guy's guitar up is probably not music you should listen to. Amen? Yeah, when you get mad enough, you're going to bust his guitar. You should probably not have it. Which have no understanding his mouth, but will be held in with bit and bridle, lest they come near unto thee. Psalm 40, verse 3. He hath put a new song in my mouth. Even praise unto our God. Many shall see it in fear and shall trust in the Lord. So before you were saved, you might have had a go-to song. It might have been Highway to Hell. Or it might have been, uh, who knows, a honky-tonk woman or honky-tonk girl or whatever. Um, any number of songs. Uh, but once you are saved, God will put a new song in your mouth. You will be amazed at the difference that God can make in your life. He will change your likes and dislikes. Yet the Lord, verse 42, uh, chapter 42, Yet the Lord will command His loving kindness in the daytime, and in the night His song shall be with me. There it is again. And my prayer unto the God of my life. Psalm 96. Oh, sing unto the Lord a new song. Sing unto the Lord all the earth. Sing unto the Lord. Bless his name. And I, I have a version of this verse in a, in a song that I, uh, Mr. Nall, we sang it when I was in choir in uh, high school. And I, there's a, a version of this that we sing in choir. Sing unto the Lord. Bless his name. Show forth his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the heathen. His wonders among all people. Psalm 18, 14, the Lord is my strength and song and is become my salvation. Psalm 119, 54, thy statutes have been my songs in the house of my pilgrimage. That's what this is. This is a temporary, this is the house of our pilgrimage. We haven't made it to the new world yet, but we're headed there. And so sing the songs of the Lord here in this place. And uh, just be careful about being taken in, all right? Uh, as with anything American, gospel music turns into a business very quickly. And you go back in days gone by where you had family group singing or you had a quartet singing uh, or maybe a soloist. And um, they would come and sing just for a love offering. And that's how it used to be. Uh, but then it turned into a business and a very lucrative business. And um, I remember back, this is going back 30 some odd years ago. Uh, we went to see the cathedrals up here at Assembly of God Church in South County. And in fact, it was South County Assembly of God, I think is what it used to be called. And uh, I heard some people talking out there and they were saying that they don't, they don't come to a church unless they get a $5,000 contract fee right, right away. And I went... Man, that was 1987. 5,000 bucks, pretty good chunk of change back then. But at that time, they had the number one bass singer, George Yance. They had the number one piano player. Um, oh, not Roger. Roger left for a little while. It was Gerald Wolf, And they had the number one tenor singer, Danny Funderburg. And... Um, I mean, they were, they were number one groups. Them, Gold City, the Kingsmen, uh, these were all the top groups. And they charged whatever it was. And it turns into a business. And then it, in the name of the business, you maintain 
Silence if one of the players or one of the singers goes bad. Kirk Talley left the cathedrals to sing with his brother Roger and his wife. And all the while he is hiding his homosexuality. And um, I remember Bonnie Day said she went to hear him sing one time. And uh, he was out somewhere in the foyer or something like that. And he was on the payphone, and she was trying to talk to him. He got real ignorant with her. And uh, shoot her off. And I think it was about the time that he was getting blackmailed. Uh, they black, what made him come out was he got blackmailed by a guy. And he said, I'm going to expose you. So he figured he had to come out. And uh, I always I had prayed for him because uh, I think initially, and it may, it may have been that way still today. I don't know. Uh, he didn't want to be that way. And he had Mark Tramble come and help him try to get through this with somebody that had specialized in ministry to homosexuals. And, um, but he, he quit singing and, um, and then eventually he lost his voice. He's, I think he's still alive, but he can't sing lick. So, you know, just, you, you pray for people like that. Then, but then you had, uh, who remembers, um, the anchor homes, Ray Bolts. He comes out. We went to a concert of his up, up in Arnold. Pretty good concert. Uh, I didn't find anything wrong with it. Uh, but it, it was But a year later, he come out as being a homosexual. And he said, God made me this way. So I noticed that his list of churches going to was Metropolitan Community Church, Metropolitan Community Church. Those were always the gay churches in every city. And he was going there to start out with. Then it started turning into something, something United Methodist Church. Something, something. Presbyterian Church. And I'm going, yeah, that sounds about right. Uh, but anyway, that's, that's how it worked. And he covered it up and hid it for a long time. And I had a, a man that I'm not going to say who it was or who is related to, but he was related to a preacher, a pastor I know. And he wasn't in one of the top groups, but he was in like one of the top 10 groups. And he was a tenor singer. And he always acted and walked and talked effeminate. Always. And he told us over dinner that he knew of at least three homosexuals that were singing gospel music right then, right, right at that time. And I'm going, I think I got one figured out. Um, he eventually quit. He eventually got out. His dad was on him all the time. You need to get out of that mess. And um, you pray for him. You don't know who he is, but pray for him. But anyway, the statutes have been my songs in the house of my pilgrimage. Then, oh, now turn to Exodus 15. You got to turn here. This is the, the gist of where I was going tonight. Now the sermon is going to start. Exodus 15. God, forgive me. You folks forgive me. It's just when I get a mouthful of stuff to say, I want to say it. Then sang Moses. And the children of Israel, this song unto the Lord. Now, here's the thing. The songs, this song that Moses sings, and there's another one in Deuteronomy. They are historic. They are hymns in that they praise the Lord. Look at verse 2. The Lord is my strength and song. The Lord, he's become my salvation. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Thy right hand, O Lord, has become glorious in power. Thy right hand, O Lord, hath dashed in pieces the enemy. This is a hymn. It's also a spiritual song in that it refers to their deliverance out of the Red Sea and from Pharaoh. But it's also a prophecy. It's a prophecy in song. Then sang Moses and the children of Israel this song unto the Lord and spake, saying, I will sing unto the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. Now stop and think for a minute of a place in the book of Revelation that has a horse and a rider. Huh? Well, no, before that. He didn't, they didn't, God didn't throw Jesus into the sea. And the horse didn't either. Yeah. Revelation 6 and the opening of the seven seals. The first four that come out have a horse and a rider. Horse and a rider, horse and a rider. And then the fourth one has death on it and hell follows with him. Okay? That's the horse and the rider. They're all simmered down into one here. The horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. Where is the beast coming from? The sea. Okay? So these are prophetic. 
Numbers 21, 17. Then Israel sang this song. Spring up, O oh well, within my soul. Sing ye unto it. The Bible says. Now I'll turn to Revelation 15. Through this badly damaged Bible. I don't know what happened. Revelations. It's not really Revelations. People say it that way. Revelation 15, verse 1. I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire. I think this is the same sea that, um, that John saw in Revelation 4. And them that had gotten the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name, four things, stand on the sea of glass, having what? My wife has always wanted to play the harp. She's always said that. I want to play the harp. So maybe I'll save up about $75,000 maybe and get her one. Okay? Because they're not cheap. Uh, but anyway, yeah, I love a harp too. I like the sound of it. Uh, so, having harps of God, and they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God. Which one? I don't know. And the song of the Lamb. There's Jesus singing. Saying, great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. You know what disturbs me about that phrase there? It's not the phrase. It's what I know in the Catholic Church. They have a queen of saints. Mary. Queen of saints. Um, Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only art holy. For all nations shall come and worship before thee. For thy judgments are made manifest. And all this is, is, has to do with music. Turn to the book that comes right after the book of Job. What comes right after Job? Psalm, Palmses. Or one little kid wrote Psalmpasm. Yeah, Psalmpasms. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. I just made that up. Nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Turn to Psalm 32 very quickly. I'm going to be done here. Psalm 32. I'll, I'll show you how important the music is to giving instruction and teaching the doctrines. They, they have to be right. They have to be in line with Scripture. I don't care if you, you know, make it 15 verses long. It didn't bother me. Um, sing it. And if it's in line with Scripture, good. If not, get you some new verses. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. This was quoted by the Apostle Paul in explaining the doctrine of salvation by grace through faith alone. And he, and he quotes, for it said in the psalm, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. And he says, you know, cometh this blessing upon those who keep the law or something like that. No, that blessing is given by grace, by God's mercy, by God's love. He blesses those whom he forgives and he completely covers 
all of their sins. Amen. And that's actually the lyrics to a song that Paul heard. Okay. Uh, he mentions the second psalm specifically uh, by that phrase. It is said in the second psalm. What does Psalm 2 say uh, about the heathen? Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? I, I used to say because they're heathen. That's why they're angry. The kings of this earth set, them, set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He's quoting that, attributing it to the second psalm. So we know we got that chapter heading right. When people say, oh, the chapters weren't in the Bible. Well, the second psalm was. Apparently it's in the right place. It landed in the right place. And uh, he's using this for doctrine, saying that the heathen are always going to hate the gospel. They're going to hate it. They're going to want it gone. And they used to burn people who loved the Bible and loved the Lord and hated the Pope. They used to burn us at the stake. Now they got a different method. We'll just get the people who say they love the Lord. We'll get them to not use the Bible anymore. In other words, we're going to get them to turn in their weapons. And they, they'll be weaponless from here on out. So people don't let go of your weapon. Amen. Let's stand. But keep in mind that all of those 150 songs are doctrinal and prophetic in nature. They are also poetic. Uh, they can be put to meter. In other words, put to song with a certain rhythm and certain tempo and so on. And um, bless anybody who can do it. But... Um, Keep in mind, this is, this is Christian music right here. And God, I, I just love him for making music for us to enjoy. Okay? Uh, can a man live his life without music? Yeah. Can he enjoy it? No. No. God's designed us so that we lift our voices up and sing. Doesn't matter if you can sing good or not. At some point, you'll do it. 